you ever plan on having a tiny wood stove in a tiny space, whether it's a van, an RV, a trailer, or a tiny house, this is your 101 before you buy and install video. I'm going to try and cram as much as I can, as fast as I can, because there's a million tiny stove videos. If you don't want a stove, I wouldn't watch. It'll be super boring. But before we get started, my name is Jill. This is my first full winter with a tiny wood stove. So I'm going to share with you my experience, what I learned, what I would recommend, why it's not going to be my full-time heat source. So we're going to launch into that on the other side. Deep breath, my friends, and I will see you in just a moment. And one more thing. Don't plan on ever having clean clothes, clean hands, or stuff without ashes all over it. It gets everywhere. <laughs> so I have been dreaming about having a wood stove for a lot of reasons for so long because uh, having lived uh, in the dirt in a tiny trailer for almost 10 years, I was primarily using electric heat. That's really, that was all I was using, and the sun. And if the electricity went out, I was cold. I got super lucky. I never had a long-term power outage, but we just saw that in Texas. It's a very, very real thing. And so uh, I was so excited to be able to launch into this winter with my tiny wood stove. And so uh, the bottom line is, is it's your most powerful heat source because it doesn't require any electricity. It does require, however, a whole bunch of other things. So uh, what we're going to do is I'm just going to go over everything I can think of. So if you are serious, I would pause here. I would get some paper and pencil and take some notes. Uh, there's tons and tons of videos on Tiny Wood Stove, and I'm trying to draw on all the things that I learned in one spot. So <gasps> let's go. Okay, the first thing I will talk about with this little tiny wood stove is that if you have a tiny wood stove, do not plan on sleeping all the way through the night. Uh, because of it, mine is about 11 by 18. It's this long form. Uh, the other ones are boxes, and then there's a round one I'll show you in a minute. And uh, one of the reasons I put it up high like this was my thinking as I sleep up here on this platform is I could just, you know, lean over and toss in a log and go back to sleep. That did not happen. Uh, you have to keep an eye on it. And I was extremely uncomfortable sleeping with the stove going if it was still active. As long as it was dying out, I was okay. But it's probably not a realistic idea to think you're going to get all the way through a night with a little stove because you just can't get those great big pieces of wood in there. Now, the flip side is, is that it does an excellent job. And because heat is dispersed up, it got up to 100 degrees back there. So difficult to regulate the heat into the Goldilocks zone. Super awesome when it's extremely cold. Difficult to manage if it's not super cold. So now that the nights are no longer in the teens, mostly 20s and 30s, uh, I actually don't use the stove anymore because it creates so much heat, it's uncomfortable. Uh, and it's incredibly labor and time intensive. So the other big takeaway for me was you don't just start a fire and look away. It's a constant, constant tending to. Uh, now, I didn't have a lot of hardwood, so I spent much more time with it than most people would. But uh, it's very important to pay attention because, as you will find if you get one, the fire will just go out. I mean, it goes out all the time. In my mind, it was like I was just going to be a kick-ass fire starter. No, I'm going to show you a great way to start a fire because there's a whole other issue with these tiny stoves and getting the fire to stay started. So let's just go with location. Uh, like I said, I put mine up here because of practical reasons because I thought, oh, I'll just be able to lean over. The problem I had is it's so cold and I'm in a steel horse trailer in here is that as the days would pass in winter and January, the floor would not recover. So it wasn't getting enough heat low in order for the floor to not continuously get colder and colder and colder, which became unbearable in terms, even though I have carpets and things down. So uh, I would never put it up here. I would put it down. Uh, my thinking was I don't want to be climbing down the stairs or the ladder in the middle of the night trying to re, uh, 
do the stove. What I ended up doing because of the situation is just letting it die out and then waking up uh, between 2 or 3 in the morning. Uh, it's coldest between 3 and 7 a.m. and getting a fire going, uh, but that usually meant I was staying awake. So I started to go to bed really early around 7 o'clock at night because it was still pretty warm and so then I could save some wood. Uh, sleeping through the warmer parts of the cold and then waking up and being awake from the colder parts of the cold. So that was one of the ways I dealt with it. Uh, the amount of heat it puts out is tremendous. So that was a awesome surprise. Um, so location, I would put mine on the ground again. Uh, I did pretty good with this situation, so I was able to put the wood underneath here. You know, it's, I took it all out, but that would warm it up. Uh, when I took the temperature, that wasn't too bad in the front or the back, so I didn't have to worry about sparking. Uh, because of the open area, I did worry about sparking, so I tried to keep this area clean. Uh, in terms of dispersing the heat, uh, you know, it's recommended to have a fan. I don't really know that this one did that much. Uh, when I was able to just temporarily run a bigger fan, uh, it worked a lot better in terms of pushing the cold air up or putting it up high and pushing the hot air down. It is shocking to have it be 100 degrees up here and 10 degrees down there. It's just shocking you can be in one space and have such a huge amount of heat uh, differences, but it, it's like there's a line. It just happens. And so uh, it's really important where you put it. Uh, in addition to that, you know, it's up through the ceiling. I wasn't able to find an elbow, so I didn't put mine out the side. Uh, I didn't have a lot of trouble with water coming in, but we didn't have a lot of rain. And this is also temporary. I will show you when I go up to the roof. So Personally, I will stick it on the ground, and I'm probably going to put it on the ground. The problem is, is how much pipe it will take to go from the floor to the ceiling. So I might have to put in another hole, which I am very much not excited about. Because, you know, once you cut through the steel, you got a real hole. There's no going back from that. Um, other things uh, about the heat distribution. This is just uh, aluminum, and it is... You know, the stove would be 700 degrees at its hottest. And the other side of the aluminum, even though it's a few inches away, would be maybe 100 degrees. And so I had... So this is an awesome tool right here. It's uh, It takes the temperature by laser. I think I've showed you before, right? Can you see that? Uh, it does centigrade and Fahrenheit, and you just do it, and you test the heat. This was awesome because I was really, really nervous I was going to do something dangerous. Uh, this is a magnetic temperature guide, and so it tells you uh, what the heat out is. It has a range of what is safe. There's no way to keep it in the Goldilocks zone. <laughs> uh, but it, you do get a feel for it. And so uh, these are two tools I would highly recommend. Uh, however, this and the bigger fan worked way better. And so uh, the amount of heat that comes out can be significant. Uh, what was interesting is I have styrofoam on my ceilings. It did not melt. And uh, where I cut a hole, uh, it's not a double wall, it's a single wall. It's a four inch stove pipe. Uh, the recommendation is to have a double or triple wall. I'm like, people didn't used to do that in the olden days. So uh, I thought I would throw caution to the wind. I didn't really have any problem. There's a little bit of charring there. Uh, my insulation in the ceiling is absolutely fireproof. I threw a piece in a fire once nothing happened to it. Uh, so I didn't have any issues with that. Uh, the other thing that I did, and this was a temperature thing, is uh, take this little pot and keep water in it. Yes, to boil it, but I could tell by the sound how hot the water was. So that was a way for me to kind of monitor the heat without having to physically uh, keep opening the door or take its temperature because once it would drop to a certain point the water would stop making noise uh, Once it got super boiling for me on this stove with this pot would had to be close to 500 degrees underneath for it actually to boil Which is why it would take 45 minutes or so first thing in the morning was a pain in the butt so uh, But that was a really powerful tool because I could just listen without having to keep my eyeballs on it uh, other things There is a lot to know uh, so this is the damper, right? So that took me a long time to figure out how to do that without extinguishing my fire in addition to managing wind coming down. 
Uh, I have two sets of holes here. But the other thing that happened is uh, the thing that closes in the door is this braid. And so this actually fell off. And, and one of the recommendations I heard was if you take a dollar bill and you put it in the door, you can make sure that it's 100% tight. My experience was you cannot have too much oxygen, and I left the door open all the time in order to get enough oxygen flow in order to create a really good flame, and that it would burn out super fast if I started to close things up. I had to have a lot of heat at the end of the fire to start shutting things down. Now that makes the wood burn faster, but when you're trying to heat things up, you really want to get going as fast as you can. And so uh, I'll show you wood when we go outside. So I spent a lot of time with the door open and I was worried about the sparks popping out. And it's really good to worry about that because they do. So you want to make sure anything you have here is protected. It's not a good idea to have foam, but that's the way this thing is set up. Uh, basic tools. Uh, I love these gloves. These are fireproof tools, but they are so bulky I didn't end up using them and I got really uh, fast and loose with my hands sticking it in there. I never got burned, but I got splinters all the time. So FYI uh, is a good fire poking tool. They It comes with one, but you really need something that you can get in there. So uh, I found the wood works better than the metal one that they that came with this stove. Uh, the other thing that that I did that was really important was I have these fire bricks. Uh, I actually it's dirtier. I would show you. Uh, I have these all inside uh, and also some down here on the table. Uh, but as you can see, they're thin. But it really is my hope to extend the life of this stove because it takes a lot of the heat off the bottom. Uh, some people do really creative things with uh, stone and masonry work on the outside. It absorbs the heat and it continues to uh, heat up even though the fire is out. Uh, so that's a very heavy option. Obviously up high here that's not going to happen and it's not a practical option if you're driving. Which brings me to heat dispersion post fire. Uh, when I watched one of these little videos, the guy's like, I never use it because we want to get up in the morning and drive and the stove is still hot. So uh, it takes about two hours for it to go totally cold and obviously you cannot pull out the, uh, the coals and things like that until you get to a certain degree of safety around that. But if you're going to use it and you're moving around a lot, it's extremely difficult because if you're, you can't obviously drive with your fire going. <laughs> Uh, plus you have to have it extremely secured. One of the reasons I did a temporary setup was because I want to be able to put it on the floor. I don't want to worry about it falling over. If I get to a position where I like full time, I may go ahead and secure it. But right now I just like the fact that I can move it. Uh, also so I can take this apart and clean it because that's a whole separate issue. We'll talk about that in a moment. So, all right, so uh, this shape, uh, there's a couple different shapes. There's this long rectangle shape and there's a lot of short ones. Uh, I've never used a short one. I imagine it would be even more complex in terms of having uh, the right size wood. Uh, 18 inches for a piece of wood is too long. Uh, ideal was in this 18 by 11 was uh, about a 11 or 12 inch log. Uh, that way I could run it uh, horizontal or vertical depending on how much heat and where I wanted to center that heat. One of the problems is that the heat goes back and up the uh, stovepipe here and so then you're losing a bunch of that heat. Uh, you can install in what's called a baffle which is a piece of metal that goes right about here. It pushes the heat down and it disperses it uh, to the sides. I never got around to doing that. That's something I would probably do in the future. Uh, my only concern would be is it would be another oxygen issue in terms of it not getting enough. Uh, so this oblong shape has a little bit more versatility and I think it's a little bit more practical uh, in terms of trying to get wood because most wood is cut in a 16 inch uh, log. So all that pre-cut stuff that guys are selling in the back of their truck you have to cut it. And uh, that is an issue because I chose to not get a chainsaw. So uh, I like this shape better than the box shape, but I've never used the box shape, so I cannot definitively tell you anything about that. Now I chose to not get a window on the front of my stove. Some of them come with a glass window. Uh, my thought process on that was if I was going to sleep, I didn't want the extra light from the flames 
turns out sleeping wasn't really an option uh, and it would have increased my ability to see what was going on in the fire without having to open the door all the time. So uh, in hindsight, I think maybe the window would have been a little bit better. It would have given me some light and it also would have been able to tell what's going on with the fire. Uh, but the flip side is if you do have a way to keep it going longer, uh, it cuts way down on the amount of firelight that's flickering, which I find hard to sleep when there's any light in the trailer. So uh, one of the other things that had been my plan was to cook on top of the stove. Uh, and you can do that. It does a great job of heating things up. Uh, the issue becomes uh, temperature uh, control and duration. So uh, anything that you wanted to cook for a really, really long time, you have to pay super close attention to the fire because the temperature just goes up and down uh, so quickly because the wood burns out so quickly because it's small. So it's something that would be a little bit more impractical other than out of necessity. So I didn't do a lot of cooking on here just because, you know, I thought I would. I didn't. If it was the end of the world, I would do whatever it takes. Uh, so one of the things I did do is I did buy a replacement braid, which I think is a good idea, even though uh, it's all the way around, even though I don't think it makes that big of a difference because a tight seal with less oxygen just didn't seem to be an issue. Uh, it, I think it's good to have that option. Uh, so I went ahead and bought that as backup, you know, in case it's something that I can't replace. And this would be, you know, my long-term option. Uh, in terms of stability, this was a cheap stove. It was $109. It's a guide gear. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. You can get it at, uh, uh, you know, online in a lot of different places. Uh, it's heavier than the other camping stove I'm going to show you, but it's not real thick. And there is... Uh, down here there is a bunch of uh, rust and I'm not exactly sure why it did that and then the top which I'll show you also did some weird things so I'm not exactly sure what's going on with that and I would say there's a slight concave uh, I don't remember if it came like that or not or it's something that's been happening with the heat uh, the stove pipe as I said is a four inch single wall I didn't have any problems uh, someone made the joke to me that you know it's too hot when it's glowing red and then I saw in the comments one time somebody heated their stove up so much it was glowing red so that might be a real thing I know at one point I did have it separated that the the uh, stove pipe had pulled apart and that I could see fire and I'm like that's probably really bad on two counts one the flame is going all the way up and two if that fell apart that'd be really bad because the flames would shoot up to the ceiling so uh, that's kind of how this stove is set up. Uh, it's about 40 pounds, so it's something that I can pick up fairly easily up and down. But again, I would stick mine on the floor. Didn't have any problems with the dog trying to get up close to it. Uh, I didn't have any problems with uh, it becoming so hot I couldn't manage it. Uh, a few times it got so hot, you know, according to this, I was really nervous because you don't want to obviously have it start glowing. But as I used it with more and more time that passed by, I got more confident and less concerned that I was going to burn the trailer down. That was a really big fear I had. So we're on top of the roof and I think I just sat in a wet spot. <sighs> I'm also looking at all the damage over the last winter. But, so this is how uh, this stove is. So this one has, uh, as you can see, so the way this one works is because uh, I would do dirty wood, it would get really filled up fast. So I had to clean this actually every couple fires. Uh, I knew that because I was getting smoked out. I came up here and I looked and these circles were all filled up. Uh, as you can see on the bottom here, uh, I have one of those silicon seals so that does a pretty good job but the top got stretched out so I put tape around it and I don't have it actually uh, secured down like most people do with uh, silicon uh, or grout or caulk and then uh, screwed in because I wanted to be able to take it apart uh, I was able to clean it from up here part of the way down and I can take this off and clean it but not all the way down. So if you don't have it, which I don't, I need to get, is one of those really long uh, metal things that go in and clean it. I just used a toilet scrubber and that worked pretty good. Um, obviously in terms of stealth, not very stealthy if you're pumping smoke out the top of your uh, 
your roof here, but a couple things about that. One is you need at least two feet here. If it's too short and it's too close to the roof, uh, you won't get enough draw and it won't, the oxygen won't pull it up. Uh, this is the point of heat dispersion when it comes from the inside to the outside is when it cools down really quickly. So you can get some condensation. I had some issue with uh, when it was wet and humidity, humid cold uh, of it of the black ash whether that's soot or creosote there was a difference of opinion on that dripping inside so that's not a good sign so you want to keep that cleaned up as best as possible oh it's totally bright out here okay so so I just wanted to show you uh, this little fire lighting technique because especially with the EPA ones this is a technique that actually works Super good. I can't find the video of the guy that showed me. So let me just show you this. So because a lot of the new stoves, you can't get the fire started in the traditional way. So if you make a V, you can see that you start with a V, paper, then you add cardboard, then you add your little pieces of wood, then your bigger pieces of wood. Once that flames up, and it gets going, then you want to come in and put your wood on top of that. But before you do any of that, oh, this is so important. What you want to do is the cold air is pushing down on this. So if you try to light a fire, so if you try to light a fire in the front here and the cold air is coming down, it will smoke you out. And that sucks. So the first thing you want to do is you want to take a piece of newspaper, you want to light it inside, and you want to put it underneath the stove pipe so that the heat travels up, up, and then out. Then you can light your fire. You don't want to do it before take my advice. Well, here's another camping stove. Now this is one of those, uh, you know, less than a hundred bucks. Everything fits inside and uh, has a different kind of top than the one I have and I'll show you that in a minute. But uh, theoretically, you know, this is where you can cook, but you can see that uh, it's gotten rusty. I haven't fixed it. It has the same vents. Uh, I was really concerned that the door wouldn't close, but now that I know that oxygen is good, I don't really worry about it. Now, uh, the thing I like about it is it's got legs, so you can put it up higher or you can leave it lower, uh, as I'm going to show you on the other one. It lets a lot more wind in, uh, but it has a cover, so uh, in terms of rain and weather and snow, you might have to protect it from the wind. Uh, thing I'm sitting on right here. Can you see that? This little wood round, that was actually an accidental discovery. Uh, the guy sold them to me really cheap uh, because I didn't have a chainsaw. But the nice thing about the big rounds is they were cut about 10 or 11 inches, which is exactly what I needed. So I have all the tools to split wood uh, and cut wood with a saw. I decided to not get a chainsaw. If you have a wood stove, you probably are going to need a chainsaw or a really good way to source your wood because again, pre-cut stuff is all going to be too big. Uh, but it also takes space. There's a lot of issues around what kind of saw, keeping it sharpened, blah, blah, blah. So a uh, huge consideration on the tiny wood stove is how you're going to source your wood, how often you can source it, where you can store it. This is all common sense stuff, but everything you need to factor in if a wood stove is right for you. So that's my video on tiny wood stoves. Uh, if you're watching this and you have more comments, put them in the links below or the comments below. I know there's more to cover, but I think I did almost everything I wanted to get to. I hope you love your wood stove as much as I love mine. Good luck. It's hard having the wood stove in a tiny space, but definitely worth it in the long run. And with that deep breath and I will see you next time.